Welcome back, perfect peeps, to perfect.dev. Today on the show, we're talking about scaling transactional data globally with Fauna. And our guest is Rob Sutter. What up, Rob? Hi, everybody. Hey. Hi, Rob everybody. just promised me me. like complete excitement throughout the entire <laughs> podcast. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> So Rob is the head developer of developer advocacy at Fauna. Um, Rob, tell me a little bit about like how you got into advocacy and got kind of with Fauna as a whole. Yeah, uh, I didn't realize advocacy was a thing that you could do. I just, you know, I'd been to conferences and people were like, hi, I'm here in Amsterdam from Portland and I'm going to talk to you about X. And I was like, that sounds like pretty sweet. Um but then I saw, I was living in Dubai and saw a position advertised for AWS for serverless uh, for the developer advocacy team there with uh, working with Chris Munz. And I knew him from Twitter and I was a big fan of serverless already. So I applied to that, did the interviews, and that's how I got my start in developer advocacy. Can we, uh, before can we that, talk about a minute about how you were in Dubai? Yeah. <laughs> like just... It's good. Like I was living in Dubai. My eyes got really big <laughs> for those. As one does. Uh, how many minutes you got? We can take this backstory way back. Um, long story day. short. So when I was 10 years old, I got a TI-99 4A and started programming in basic. I'll skip forward a little bit. I was okay. a, a software right, engineer good. in a number of places, um, like prestigious places, back alleys. You know, I wrote some code I'm not proud of, um, but... Then I became a uh, co-founder, co-founded a software as a service startup when we were in Amsterdam after my wife and I got married. Uh, so we were two years there. And then that uh, ran its course, which, as we all know, is a polite euphemism for ran out of money. And um, I had previous to that been living in the Middle East and North Africa. We were looking like, where can we like, where can we go from here? What's next? Uh, my wife was able to get a job in Dubai. I figured I'll be able to get a job once I get there. And so off we went. Um, job situation didn't turn out the way we envisioned, but we our son was born in Dubai, so wow. it will wow. forever be a magical place for us. In fact, we're recording video, right? So let me let me do a. Uh... For those on the audio, Rob has <laughs> yeah. disappeared to grab a hat. So how many languages do you speak? Do you know what that no. says on the top? Yeah. Now, so for those who are listening on audio, I've returned with a hat on my otherwise gloriously shining bald head. Um, and the alt tag for this hat would be a desert camouflage hat with a red field and white letters that say Dubai. Uh, El Milagro del Desierto. So it's the miracle in the desert in Spanish. And then above that, Dubai in um, Arabic, probably obvious for those of you who can see this. So, Yeah. <laughs> So that's what I was doing in Dubai. Yeah, I have to. Got I have to with... assume you speak at least two languages. Am I? Am I close to correct? Uh, yeah, most of them poorly at this point. Uh, <laughs> my wife is Turkish, so I definitely know when I'm getting yelled at, and I can. I, I that's. I love you, honey. Like she's she's too good to me. She doesn't yell at me, and I don't deserve her. She is the better half of this pair, this team. Uh, but I do speak, you know, enough Turkish. Um, a little bit of Arabic, a couple dialects, some French, some Spanish, some Russian, some Bulgarian. Uh, we're going to call oh, back yeah. to this later in the show, <laughs> folks. Stay tuned. This is going to make an appearance again, and you're going to be like, ah, that's Full what he was talking about. Full, Full circle. circle. It's going to be great. Full circle. I love it. <laughs> okay, so you're in Dubai. Then you met some like Twitter-ish people. Back to yeah. present somewhat? Yeah. I, I was I was like big into serverless development. Um, okay. So our software as a service startup, we did the whole container thing, and we were like, "Ooh, man, this." Mm. Um, but we were this is early days, right? Like Lambda was announced 2015, I think, and so this was like 2016, and we were already using it to manage our infrastructure. Wow. Um, so I was a big fan. Like I saw the potential, I understood it, and I was already following all the the influencers in the space on Twitter, including Chris Mons. And so when he posted that he had a job on his team, I jumped on it. We had a few conversations, some interviews. I flew to, flew to Seattle and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, and then I was a DA with AWS for a not, not quite two years. 
when, uh, when I had this opportunity with Fauna. Fauna is the data API for modern applications. It's delivered with a serverless operations model. So, you know, I, I knew the value proposition immediately. I got it. I understood it. I had done some work with some other serverless databases that weren't as um, capabilistic. That's a word now. Um, <laughs> That, that require like certain specialized knowledge and Fauna requires to an extent, like, you know, you, any database you have to practice with it, but Fauna really rewards that a lot more. So I was hooked. And, and now here I am helping people write applications that span regions uh, and, and the globe without having to deal with eventual consistency. So I love it. Can you explain what capabilistic means? Capabilistic? Of or in the manner of something which is highly capable. Okay. C A P A B I L I L I L I L I. Am I S S I S S? Just keep going. Sorry, I've I've glitched. That's my uh. That's my log four J input. Nice. For today, that 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 joke's not going to be as relevant when this airs as it is today, but trust me, everybody, it was funny. <laughs> uh, so not to like completely go <laughs> back and forth and all over the place, was your emphasis at AWS on like Lambda infrastructure for your advocate portion? Uh, so it was the serverless team. It was the serverless product org, which was AWS Lambda, AWS Step Functions, Amazon SQS, SNS, EventBridge, uh, AWS Step Functions. I think I said that already. I said it twice because it's my favorite. Love that team. Love that service. It's like hey, two step. That's right. Step functions. It's finite state machines. Um, it's application integration and coordination. They've released a ton of great stuff since. Uh, it's it's really yeah. the most powerful service for working with AWS in AWS is AWS Step Functions. So how do that's you not how why do you we're here about Amplify over there though? Well, I mean, Alex, like that's partly a competitor to us, right? So I'm not going to, uh, we are, we are always looking at what the best in the industry are doing and how we can incorporate aspects of what users love about their products into our Very well products. Said. That's, that's all I needed to hear. Perfect. So, transition <laughs> a lot of respect then, for that team. A lot of respect for that team. But, but you spawn <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Transition that and tell me why Fauna is different and why we should mm -hmm. choose Fauna over these other products that are out there. Yeah. Well, so AWS Amplify is tightly integrated with AWS, right? And so it makes sense if you're if you're in all those services, it's an abstraction layer over it. Um, Fauna isn't, but Fauna does support workloads across AWS. And you know, one thing that happened this week for viewers and listeners um, as we record was the US East One outage, right? Where a number of services went down and you know, we, a lot of people were talking about it and it's not, AWS did not go down. Like that's, that's you know, let's not be hyperbolistic about this. Um, but if you had architected your application to be only on one region, then you might have suffered greatly as some very big names, including Amazon themselves did um, earlier this week. Now, because of Fauna's model, it's a single phase, strongly consistent transaction across multiple regions. So when one of those regions disappears, the rest of your app just continues to run. So it's, uh, you know, we've, we've done talks where we talk about active, active architectures for disaster recovery and business continuity. It's kind of that, but without the expense of a traditional active active architecture where you have to run two copies of everything and you're just like wasting money when you're not using it because Fauna is serverless. If all of your requests get sent to one or sent to the other or evenly distributed across both or some other combination, it's still the same cost, right? So because you're, you're paying by the transaction not by pre-provisioned capacity, which is one of those four tenets of serverless. You're paying for value. So mm -hmm. it enables you to have that hot active active architecture with you know Lambda functions in US East, Lambda functions in US West, your data spanning both. And if you were on Fauna, I, I didn't see a single report of an outage for our customers during the outage. So I think that's the, the biggest advantage, 
right? Can can we talk a little bit about how Fauna compares with something like Google Firestore? Both both from a like database like document collection JSON based blah 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 like you can name all the NoSQL ones you want um, from that segment and then also kind of what you're talking about the globally transactional. Yeah, so Firestore, I believe there's so many of these things to keep track of. So please don't come at me if I get this wrong. Uh, I believe Firestore is eventually consistent, right? Yep. It, and that means that you have to introduce complexity in your architecture for the sole purpose of making sure that you have the updated version of what you want, right? That's not, that doesn't add value to your customers. Your customers don't say, wow, they really handled eventually consistent, eventual consistency better than anybody I've ever seen, right? Your customers don't care. They want to like, wow, they served up my cat pictures faster than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> That's what they care about. Um, it's and true. so with Fauna, you can you can treat it that way. It's like, well, I wrote I wrote the metadata about that cat picture. Can I please have it back? And Fauna goes, yes. And you get the updated version every time without having to architect all that. Like eventual consistency is complex. Distributed systems are complex. Fauna underneath is complex, but exposes a single endpoint as if it were a synchronous read write, which from the user's perspective it is. And so it's really simple to use at scale compared to some other kind of distributed solution, Firestore or otherwise. So let's let's talk for a minute, and hopefully this example works. So I'm on Twitter, and let's pretend Twitter was um, you know run by Firestore, and it got hot, like it went viral, and everyone's hitting that like button or the heart button, and they're mashing it like crazy, and it's going through its counter business, and <laughs> um, as it as it counts up, like that thing is not going to be consistent for everyone. So you're going to be at like one person's going to have a thousand likes. The other person's going to have 2000 as it catches up, but it'll eventually get there. That's the eventual consistency model. However, mm -hmm. with Anna, what, what does that look like more on the transactional piece to that? Yeah, there's a great, I'm going to see if I can talk to you and find this cartoon for uh, anyone who may be viewing it at the same time, there's an eventual consistency cartoon that I love. I don't know if Ooh. you've seen it in one panel there. Uh, they're reaching down. Um, we can, we can if, definitely pause here to find it. Uh... It's on. No, I got it. I got it. I'm going to send it to you and you can, you can do what you will with it. Um, so Fauna is an operational database first and foremost. And a, a lot of times there can be confusion around that. What does that mean? The, the counter example isn't necessarily the one that we would pick for an operational database because that it's largely irrelevant. Uh, something like inventory, however, is not. Uh, financial transactions, things like that. If you have, think about um, you know, the latest Yeezys are going on sale and there's 50,000 of them and you've got a waiting room and 5 million people show up for your waiting room, right? And you don't have 50,000 units. You have actual numbered serial numbers, different sizes, different colorways, all of these different things, right? And so this, as soon as somebody claims one of those, it needs to be unavailable for everyone else in this high volume uh, you know, race to get what they want. With Fauna, once that right is in there to claim it, there is no other way of getting that data back because it is a complete transaction. It's done. Everything else is waiting for that. It comes back and it says this is blocked, right? Uh, whereas with eventual consistency, you could see a person in New York and a person in Los Angeles both stake a claim on that. Both of the replicas accept their claim. And now you've got a conflict in the middle. And how do you, mm -hmm. how do you arrange that, right? So because of the transactional nature of Fauna, because it's strongly consistent, you can avoid that. And it's, you know, it's one of the use cases that, that we like to see. The other one, of course, financial transactions, um, as, I, as I hinted at. But you can't have eventual consistency on a financial transaction. How much money do I have? $1,000. Okay, send it to, send $900 <laughs> to each of these 1,000 people as fast as you can, right? Like that's not how finance works. Um, and strong consistency prevents that behavior. Is, is there any sort of drawback in doing that from, you know what, hang on, let me, let me ask that in a minute. Because you provided me with this sweet photo, I've got to, I've got to bring it up. Oh yeah. I've, I've zoomed <laughs> in the best I can and I don't know how we can describe this for the, the people on audio, but 
essentially there's there's an you need old to read lady. it that's I, I don't know that i can uh, so there's there's an old lady and a superhero and the old lady says the kitty is stuck in the tree and then in the next yeah, what, yeah. what do you call it in a cartoon the next box I panel guess? panel uh, thank you yeah and in the next panel she says can you climb all the way up there and get the cat and the superhero says no need and he reaches down into a panel below them and just grabs the cat out of the tree. And then in the next panel, suddenly he's giving that cat he grabbed to the old woman. But yet there's a cat in the tree still. And she says, wait, there's two. And the superhero says, yes, but no, it's just a bit out of sync. Check again. And then all of a sudden the second cat in the tree has gone. And so yeah. the, the joke being <laughs> what Rob found here is this is eventual consistency. That's right. This is an awesome and ridiculous photo. I think we <laughs> might have to incorporate it in our actual <laughs> like that is uh, amazing. hero blog. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's yeah. Schrodinger's data, right? There's, yeah. there's two copies, one copy or no copy, depending on your, uh, your observer. Einstein would love this stuff, right? It's all relative. Totally. It's just math, right? Cool. Math. So now, now I'll get back to my, my question. Now that you've conveniently described uh, eventual consistency, transactional consistency, what are the drawbacks to a person using it? Is it still fast enough or faster? Like, what does mm. that mean to me? Like, I'm used to SQL yeah. and transactions and being blocked and things. Yeah. Yeah. It was convenient how I described that, wasn't it? It's almost like I planned that. Um, well, the reason that we didn't do this historically is exactly what you just talked about, right? It's like the speed of light and the approach to this, there, there were several and you look at distributed consensus protocols like Raft and Paxos, but the database model was, okay, I want to write to this record. So I'm going to create a lock and that lock propagates to all the replicas and all the replicas know, okay, I can't do anything. I can't read to or write from this record until this lock is expunged, right? I say write too much. I'll try to avoid that for the rest of this podcast. What that causes is in the best case, you have to go out on the wire to each replica, get them to confirm and get the response back, then do your work, then send the confirmation of the work out so that they all record the same replica, get that confirmation back then send it back out and release the lock. And you can compress those last two where if you're successful in replicating the work, you release the lock. But this is called two-phase locking, right? It's, hey, I want to do a thing. Everybody tell me it's okay to do it. Cool, cool. All right, I did a thing. And that just adds these round trips. It adds so much latency. Fauna is based on this, uh, this uh, paper out of Yale in 2012 called the Calvin Papers. Uh, I think it's postdoctoral research paper. Um, I can put a link for that in here too, for those of you who are giant nerds like me. It is fantastic reading. <laughs> fauna.link slash Calvin. If you're following along on audio, that's fauna.link slash Calvin with a C. Um, the Calvin paper just describes, you know, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it's basically deterministic replication where you don't say, here's the data. You say, here's what we're going to do. And once it's recorded, it's almost like a form of event sourcing where each of the replicas then applies that same deterministic, idempotent, pure function to modify the state of your database. And you just keep moving forward. It's a single phase. So this is how we can achieve things. If you go to status.fauna.com, you'll see our actual latency timings. Typically writes in a, in a US or an EU region group hover in the sub 50 millisecond reads hover in single digit millisecond because you're reading from the closest replica because you can because every write was a transaction and it was strongly consistent so you just go to wherever is there to get the data that is much more performant than these multi-phase locks the multi-phase locks ruin you know you're approaching a second just because of speed of light concerns by the time you finish your update and if you have high velocity updates like these you know 10 million, 5 million users trying to get 50,000 pairs of Yeezys, you can't have that. It's just you, the back pressure becomes so much that eventually your system just falls apart. Uh, whereas with Fauna, you just write on to the end of this thing as, as fast as you want. That's pretty wild. So is there any 
I'm just grasping at things here that I'm hearing because this is all way over my head. Um, is there any comparison at all to like blockchain in the way that functions or no? So a blockchain is essentially an immutable ledger and you can replicate this with Fauna, but it's centralized, right? The, the idea of the blockchain is that ledger is distributed amongst an unknowable number of nodes. They gain consensus according to the algorithm that they implement and it's stored there. What are the upsides of this? The upsides of this are you don't have to trust in a, a business, an organization, an entity. You don't have to worry about you know their viability, whether they're going concern, et cetera, whether they're looking at your data. And there, you know, there are other controls around that. The downside of this is blockchains cannot approach the speed that uh, that even multi-phase locking across a couple of replicas of a, a traditional RDBMS has. Right? The oh, I said right again. It, they <laughs> they don't have the same performance. It doesn't mean that they're that they're without value, right? You're just what? Which one of those matters more to you as a developer with your use case? Which one of those things is more important? And in fact, we play very well with a number of L2 blockchains, side chains that are storing their off-chain data in Fauna because the size of those blocks that you put onto the blockchain, the smaller they are, the more performant they can be. And typically they're intentionally limited. Whereas a document in Fauna can be up to 16 megs and then you back it with something like object storage for you know, very large binary objects. And you've, you've got a nice you know, scalable little pattern there where each thing lives in its appropriate place. Like everything else in software development, it's all about the use case. Like which one of these things offers the best user experience for your users doing what they're trying to do with your software? Nice. It's generally Fauna. Start with Fauna. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so before we jump into our kind of little demo here, um, what what are like the primary... I know, I know the answer is probably going to be anything, but like, what do you see Fauna primarily being used for right now? Like, is it just web developers are jumping on it? Is it financial systems? I, I know you could probably use it for anything, but what are you seeing kind of the trends right now? Well, no, let me, let me give you maybe a surprising answer. Let me tell you what not to use it for. Uh, operational databases are bad at ad hoc querying and analytics, right? Like if you make one distinction between databases, it's analytics over here and operational databases over here. So this is your OLTP and OLAP workloads, right? Um, operational databases, you need to know your data access patterns. You typically list them out as part of your application architecture, right? Find user by ID, get order by ID, get product by order, all of these things, right? Like add item to cart. You, you have these documented somewhere and then you can optimize for each of those, whether it's by creation of indexes or creation of user-defined functions, or it's something so that essentially every operation you do, you're targeting big O of one or theta of one complexity, right? You want it to just do it, return, do it, return, do it, return, get on with your life. Analytics, you can't do that. Uh, you can't build an index over every possible combination of columns in a 200 column wide table, right? Like sure. you're just, ah, oh, right, ah. Oh. You can't do it. You're going to run out of storage. Your index. It. Yeah, I'll, I'll just keep using it. That's, that's the third time. So we just have to hear it from here on out. It's prohibitively expensive. Um, so a, an operational database is optimized to do the types of things that support those O of one operations and not to do the things that support those spread out operations. So I would, I would say first avoid that category. In terms of what we see specifically, um, what do we call uh, user data stores? In particular, Fauna has this concept called region groups where your database can be global or it can be in the US or it can be in the EU. And they're all distributed across multiple regions in those areas. But you can it, it becomes pretty evident why you would want EU user data stored in the EU, US user data stored in the US for performance reasons. Rest of world data can be stored rest of world, right? And those will be treated as separate databases, but you also have the data residency from the, from the compliance and from the performance um, aspects with it. So if you have a global user base, that's a good, a good fit for Fauna. And if you're building with something like Next.js, SvelteKit, you're deploying to Vercel or Cloudflare or pages with functions or workers, something that is inherently distributed and inherently stateless, you want a database that's gonna be pushed out to more locations closer to where your compute is likely to occur, 
so that you have lower latency between your compute nodes and your and your data layer. That's another good one. If you're building an, a Next.js or a Svelte Kit application from scratch, yeah, chuck Fauna in there. And you know, wherever your users are hitting it from, you're going to have a better overall experience and latency. Uh, you know, your your median, your P90, your P95 is going to be much better than just a single re region. Now, if your users are hyper localized, if your users are, you know, if you're making an app for X in Los Angeles, um, then again, that today, Fauna might not be the right answer because it's offering something that you don't need. But stay tuned for private region groups, people, where you choose where to put your data and how to replicate it. Hmm. No, no promise that? delivery date, but... Hmm. Stay tuned. Do you like have to have server farms just sitting everywhere to do that? How do you do that? Us. Our servers are free range. Um, they're grass fed. We let them out. <laughs> uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, can I have a server in my backyard? Like a chicken or it, a goat? <laughs> you need to, you need to ask your HOA. Okay. Um, no, so it, that's, that that sounds is, expensive. They'll charge way too yeah, much. Yeah, for sure. You think it's you think getting your lawn mode is expensive. Fauna is delivered as a service today. Uh, so we handle the hosting for you. We handle it on cloud service providers. Typically, that means AWS. If you have other CSPs that you want to see it on, we're always happy to talk to you and find out what those are. We are, uh, you know, much as the big cloud service providers build out their regions on a continuous basis, we're building out our region groups on a continuous basis based on customer demand. So if what we offer today doesn't precisely suit your needs, come let us know and we might offer it tomorrow. Not literally tomorrow, in the future. Let me, <laughs> let me caveat that just, just a little bit. But we're, as I said, we're looking at giving you the ability to define that for yourself rather than just a, a set of curated ones that we offer you. That is so incredible. feedback always welcome, people. Yeah. Cool. Um, what I would like to kind of transition over to is I'll share my screen and show off just a simple dashboard. So let me bring that up. Maybe. Simple things are the best things. Um, so this is this is kind of the Fauna dashboard that you get. I'm totally off in my... There we go. I, I threw together just this blog data, which is not blog data because it's an example. <laughs> I don't know why I named it that, but I threw this together right before the, the pod. And I just wanted to kind of showcase what Fauna from at least a dashboarding experience looks like. And then Rob can correct me on all my assumptions that I'm making. Um, so I'm, I'm used to things like indexes in DynamoDB and in Firestore and things like that. Collections to me, seem like they are very similar to Firestore document collections, but I see JSON happening here as well. So can we talk a minute about structuring data in Fauna and like references and things like that? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, can we go back real quick? Let me, let me, I want to hit on one thing at DB Overview. Uh, for those listening to us, we're looking at the dashboard of DB Overview and we, Alex talked about collections and indices. There's also databases and you can create child databases under your databases because everything is essentially a document in FaunaDB. And this will come back into play when we go to talk about the documents and the question that you just asked. But a database is just a document that lives under another database. And you can just keep bringing that further and further down. It's documents all the way down. So if we go back to collections where you asked your other question and you choose, you know, we've got the customer's collection here and you open it up, one of those. Um, as you said, they're, they're structured as JSON objects or as JSON documents that you can think of this if you're coming from a relational database background as a table. I believe MongoDB also calls them collections. So for document databases, uh, collection is kind of the, the common nomenclature. The reference up there is what you can think of as a primary key. And you see in Fauna, it has two parts, uh, a reference object, uh, which is the collection where it belongs in an ID. In this case, you have um, an artificial ID of 101 that's created when you generate the sample data here uh, or that you generated on your own query when you put it in. But we'll also generate 
IDs for you um, that roll forward dynamically. Now, the thing is when you're using this from a driver, you could treat that entire ref object as one thing. That object can be compared to other ref objects on a deep equals basis, et cetera. It, you know, ref collection customers 101 is not the same as ref collection owners 101. The, the ID is not the unique identifier. The combination of the collection and the ID is. So that's what we say with that reference there. The next field that, you know, of course you won't see if you're listening, but it's TS. That's a Unix timestamp in microseconds of when the transaction was written to the logs. This enables a feature that we call temporality. And this is, it's getting a little bit advanced, but to me, it's fascinating. You can query fauna at a point in time by just wrapping your entire query with the uh, function call at. So it's at wow. the query and the timestamp. And if you have history enabled on your collection, fauna moves you know, forward and backward in time to examine your data as it existed at that state. So, you know, if a bad record gets written, you could subtract one, look at your data from that state and begin your recovery process. This is especially useful if you're doing stuff like event sourcing and you have, you know, just a stream of immutable rights coming in that you want to regenerate. You can roll back to some point in time with more fine grain basis than you would normally. But it's yeah, like it's time travel history. in your database. Yeah. It's like git commit history for databases. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, you have history on your documents as well. And these are set settings that you tune when you create the collection. We provide you some reasonable defaults. Um, but yeah, you're just keeping those different versions of that document on a, um, I forget the term now, what do you call it? Like a reverse delta basis. The same way Git works, just as you point out. And so then, yeah, that assume... data key there is the rest of your object. Cool. I have to assume there's probably an example of like a product on an order or vice versa in here. Here we go. Stores at least. Yeah. So it's pretty cool mm -hmm. because everything is kind of set up as that ref. You can always just go back to it. Right. And this is fancy. in an RDBMS, this is your foreign key, right? Yeah. This is what you're thinking of. So you're not having to learn an, a single table design pattern. You're modeling your data, representing your data and storing your data the same way that you've always thought about it, but more importantly, the same way that it exists in the world, right? Your code model matches your domain model. And that's really powerful because it's easy to reason about. It works the way you think it would. I need to get products by order or by store here. Well, then I need a, an index over store, not learn some new paradigm for creating secondary indices and all of these things, right? It, it's, uh, it's pretty intuitive for users who have worked with relational databases before mm -hmm. as well. And when we start to look at the indexes, are these created by Fauna out of the box or do these, do you have to create these yourself as you're kind of discovering what you're searching for? So it all depends. You can access Fauna either via GraphQL, in which case we'll create a lot of them for you based on your schema, or you can access it via a driver. And that's okay. using the Fauna query language, which is the native way of interacting. But we have drivers for you know, .NET, JavaScript, Go. Um, we code some up in Rust. There's community drivers for Dart, et cetera, right? In those cases, you have to define the indexes yourself. We give you plenty of examples and, and documentation around it. But again, with GraphQL, the GraphQL service is really powerful. You upload a schema, we create queries and mutations. If there are associative entities in those relationships, we create the indexes behind them to allow you to get the data in a single query or a single, uh, to write it in a single mutation, to either create or link with uh, other entities. And, and then we all also, we don't create this for you, but we allow you to create custom resolvers to enhance those queries as well and mutations with additional functionality behind them. You're taking a lot of the hard parts of databases out and making it so much simpler. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say when you're working with a database in a production application at scale, you're not going to get away from the hard parts. Like there's, there's always a place there. Um, 
we've been working really diligently to smooth your journey to the hard parts so that rather than, you know, climbing a, a wall, you, you're just going up a nice circular road around the mountain. And all of a sudden you've got this beautiful view, right. Of your, your application and all the things that you've learned along the way. Um, we continue to put a lot of effort into that. I wouldn't say that we've perfected that yet, but it's, it's what we're focusing on is making that one thing like one change at a time. Right. And that's why if you're, if you're new to databases or if you're a front end developer who has no experience with databases, really respect, uh, really suggest coming in with GraphQL and starting that way, because it's a paradigm that there's a ton of documentation on, but it's also, you know, that, that matches what you see in your front end as well. And there's a lot of dynamic generation that we do for you. Um, and, you know, as you said, we can do a demo. I can show you some of that, but it's, it's also going to be, we've also got some learning resources that we're going to share with you if you want to do that on your own. Awesome. Uh, just real quick before we shift over to those learning resources, I just want to make sure we cover functions as well, because they seem pretty powerful. Um, mm -hmm. So is this actually executing like a Lambda or a serverless function under the hood and doing like F, uh, sorry, Fauna query language underneath it as well? Yeah, I love UDFs, user defined functions, more than any person should. I get so just irrationally excited about these and it's only because they're the most awesome thing to work with. They um, now, you know, looking at them, they look like Lisp because they're inspired by Lisp, but they are little l lambdas, meaning that they are anonymous functions that you write and that are closed over, including their data. They're, they're not AWS Lambda functions or Microsoft Azure functions or Cloudflare workers or anything like that. These are executing inside Fauna, inside okay. the nodes on your data. And this is another powerful advantage of Fauna. A, you've encapsulated this business logic. So whether you call it from your GraphQL resolver or whether you call it from your .NET application compiled for Windows or whether you call it from your JavaScript application in the browser, it's the same business rule written once. And we've been putting a lot of work into unit testing and composition and all of these aspects of it. So it's a really robust language. This, these are not your father's stored procedures, if you'll permit the, uh, the expression, right? This is not original PGSQL or TSQL. These are much more powerful. But the fact that they run on the data and meet all of those criteria that we talked about earlier, they're idempotent, they're deterministic, they're pure, means that you still don't have to lock. They just get pushed out as the actual transaction is the function. It's the application of the function, not the um, artifact of the function that gets pushed out. Right. So it enables this speed that way, but it's also computing on the node. So if you look at a, a competing pattern, if you needed to pull data out of DynamoDB, load it into Lambda, run through all the data computing and then return it to the database, you've got network calls there. You're pulling out data that you don't want. Fauna is using the index to only read in constant time the data that you want. It's performing the compute operation at the end of that, which is essentially like a map and a reduce, depending on how you define it. And then it's returning that result to you, whether it's a set, a scalar, what, however your business logic, a string, whatever you're doing there, objects, whatever. Uh, but it's happening on the data. And the combination of those two things makes this just lightning fast. That's how you see those single digit millisecond operations. That's I love awesome. functions. Can we talk about functions more? <laughs> I love them. So I love the powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I love, the, I love the fact that, like you said, like often you're spinning up a Lambda or something else and that's ex executing and still having a callback and all that fun. So that, that totally makes sense how powerful they are. Shifting gears a little bit, not a whole lot. We're talking a lot about uh, GraphQL and I think, Rob, you have a new course coming out. Is course the right word? Maybe, maybe it's the wrong word. We call it a workshop. You can uh, you can call it a course. That's fine. It is a it is a guided learning path where about the only assumption we make when you show up is that you're familiar with GraphQL enough to know that there are queries, mutations, and a schema. Um, the first section walks you through Fauna. It's only your browser. It should take you about an hour. It shows you all the power. It again, it iterates in one piece at a time. 
The second section, you build a, a client app currently in Next.js. We're about to release the Svelte Kit version of that as well soon. Might be out by the time, you, uh, by the time you're listening to this. Who knows? For, for um, those on audio, I Brittany just raised her hands in excitement. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we just got to get Brittany to do the code review, which she didn't know she was doing until that came out of my mouth. So <laughs> here we go. But, but what it is, is you're building a multi-tenant SaaS app that's fully serverless. And so the first section is just understanding how Fauna works with GraphQL. The second section is creating that single admin app, right? Where users sign up for an account with you. Think of it as like Shopify or something where you sign up for a store. And then the third chapter, which you don't see here yet that we're releasing after we do Svelte Kit, is for every tenant who signs up, you're creating a new database for them populating that with their information as they you know, add their products, their users, et cetera, and deploying all of that as well onto different platforms. So you, know, you show up with you know, a, a query, a mutation, and a schema in your browser. And at the end of it, you have a fully deployed, production-ready, globally distributed, serverless e-commerce, multi-tenant SaaS application. You and so say that all over again. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't. Because one of those isn't even a thing. I just made it up to see if you were paying attention. No. Um, I like that. But yeah, but I want to go do that. <laughs> it's it's a big journey. Now it you know it takes some time. The first chapter is an hour. The second chapter is about two hours, and the third chapter will probably be about the same. But even still, you're looking at a day. You and your dev team can go from not having used this platform to having deployed onto your provider of choice. Um, you know, we'll, we'll target different providers with adapters, let's call them, having learned our lesson from the success of Svelte uh, so that you can deploy onto those providers and, you know, go out and run this thing your way. And is this, again, is this a free workshop? It is. No matter how you slice it, it's a free workshop. It's available on the internet. You can do it self-paced. We run it in our Discord server from time to time. Right now, we're oh, doing awesome. closed runnings to work the kinks out. Um, we also have a solutions architecture team that can come in and give this workshop at your company if you want oh, to wow. build with Fauna and you know have it customized a little bit to your needs. Uh, so it's, what's your what's your use case? Are you a curious yeah. developer? Go to the website, sign up for a free account. You don't have to put your payment information in. You can complete the workshop using only the free tier. Knock yourself out. Are you a team looking to ship faster and use you know, Fauna and serverless architectures as a competitive advantage? Bring the essays in. Um, something in the middle, come meet us in Discord. Fauna.link slash Discord. Come join us. Ooh, write that down, Brittany. <laughs> Cool. Um, what am I missing on Fauna before we move ahead? Have I forgotten anything to ask you that just sticks out for people like new to Fauna or, you know, kind of maybe they've started and like created something, but they haven't taken that full journey yet? If they've created and haven't taken the full journey, I'd really suggest the first part of that workshop, even if they're building with something other than GraphQL, because it gives you the idea of like, the, we started this workshop calling it the Zen of Fauna. It was, you know, just tenets for how to build with Fauna effectively, avoid, you know, speed bumps and set yourself up for success. Uh, the, I would also take it the other direction. The one thing we haven't talked about is security and Fauna offers phenomenal security capabilities. The fact that all of those user-defined functions can be composed means you can write TypeScript libraries that do you know, input checking and sanitization, that do permissions checking, and then use those as frameworks for creating functions. Strong application security story there. We haven't even gotten into ABAC, which is dynamic determination of authorization based on any factor that you can calculate. User identity, a role provided by a third-party provider like Auth0, time of day, IP address of access, all of those can be encapsulated into your business rule to determine should this request at this point in time, given all of this context, be allowed to run or not. It's much more than just, well, here's your admin role. It can do everything. Here's your user role. It can read its own information. It's practically infinitely customizable. It's really but incredible. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's very powerful story. 
I, uh, I immediately went to the, the cover image of ABBA when you said ABAC. I don't know why. I, I went down to a weird road. All right. Chant, 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 chant. <laughs> he knows. Take a chance uh, on Fauna. Sorry. No more singing. I promise. <laughs> Today. Now, because we covered everything, I mean, that we can cover in 45 minutes on Fauna, we're going to do some perfect picks. And Rob was kind enough to uh do you want do you want to do the thing rob for your pick this Whoa. is my perfect pick it's a dunlop one it's millimeter a it's a pick <laughs> if yeah for those of you listening that probably made no sense at all it's a guitar pick literally <laughs> made in the usa everybody dunlop one millimeter just the right amount of you know the right amount of give but the right amount of strength for when you're tremolo picking those angry, angry, hard metal riffs. That's my pick. And the awesome autofocus. Like, I love when people like just <laughs> put it right in the camera. <laughs> I was really happy that worked. I, I wasn't sure how that was going to go. I'm like, is my face big enough to offset this? <laughs> the answer was yes. For those of you listening, my face is enormous. <laughs> so it was fine. So when Rob did this pick originally, I went searching for something I could like link out to, and I found this, <laughs> which is a seventy dollar guitar, pick, which is just insane. But I instead yeah. linked out to the rest of the Dunlop picks, which are a little okay, more reasonable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I now I did get a seventy-two pack of those, but it was also not seventy dollars. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's insane. Aren't you supposed to like throw them to your groupies or something? I I don't know. If you got seventy dollars to spend on a guitar pick, call me. Yeah, yeah. you should do I a jam be in a band with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, your second pick, which My is the full pick. circle piece, I believe. Full circle. <laughs> this is a this is two novellas. It's the last two in a series of five by Soviet author Yuri Trifonov. And the one I want to focus on here is The House on the Embankment. I first read these, I first read that uh, in 2005 when I was a student studying Russian literature and language. Maybe it was 2004, I don't know, so long ago. But it's a fantastic book about a boy growing up in, uh, in an apartment block that is provided to apparatchiks in the Soviet Union. And the, mark, the marked contrast in living standards between the ones who make the rules and the ones who are forced to live by them. Um, I don't want to, I'm not going to make it political or anything else. It's just a great storytelling and it, it's a lesser known author and a lesser known style that I think a lot of people might not be exposed to otherwise, but it's a timeless classic. It's a really, really great book. It's a novella. It's close to a hundred pages. If you only read the second one, I highly recommend it. Good pick. Sure. All right, Britt, you're up. All right. Uh, so mine is a fauna connection in a spelt REPL, and it kind of shows off a little bit of the power of spelt, how you can just write this vanilla JavaScript. And the I have very little experience with databases, period, but I'm used to writing all this node code like to connect and having to use Express to do some weird connections and <laughs> This just looks so simple, and I am for sure going to be trying to hook up Fauna to the Salt Siren site after this. So, very intrigued. That is kind of wildly simple. If if that's all of it, cool. That's the connection right there. Huh. Awesome. Wow. Brit's second pick. My second pick. I'm all about finding this like knockoff cheap stuff that will like serve the purpose of what I need it to do. So this is my new watch, the Amazfit band. And it like tracks my sleep, tracks my steps, tells me my heart rate all the time, tells me my blood oxygen level, because I need to know that for some reason. Huh. Um, yeah, I don't know for $35. I think I got it on black Friday for like 25. I don't know. It wow. was super cheap and it works really well. So you could get is... two and send both feeds to fauna yes. and compare them. <laughs> to see if like you have more oxygen oh, I need saturation to dive into in the your APIs right arm. of some of these yeah. things. That would be interesting. <laughs> I love it. I don't know how you find these things sometimes. So this is like the cheaper <laughs> because fit. Because I'm cheap. 
She's got this fancy new job. I keep telling her it's okay. <laughs> frugal. frugal, frugal, not cheap. Yes, fr frugal. very frugal. Value, value oriented. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so my first pick, Ooh. I unfortunately am not frugal, I guess, is a very expensive outdoor um, Wi-Fi enabled GE lighting plug. That's not uh, that guess, bad. For lack of better terms. Especially um, for an outdoor one. Yeah, like I, I had a bunch of other ones and inevitably I would overload them with Christmas lights. So I just finally said I'm, I'm buying this thing. Interestingly enough, each plug operates separately, so mm -hmm. you can you can have whatever your front lights and your I don't know I don't, I don't know what you'd use that for, but I have one going to our front porch and one going to the rest of the house, and it can handle the load, and I don't have to worry about getting wet. I don't think uh, it's still under a roof, but that's why. How many how many amps does that thing draw? Do you know? I don't. Um, I'm I'm over here giggling. Just I did unstoppably. See you kind of Man, if I had two of these, one would get hooked up to our pressure washer and the other would get hooked up to our snow blower and they would just be sitting there lying in wait. And occasionally I would just have to like have them turn on and spray. <laughs> I don't know. That sounds super Not dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like spray over the house as part of your your Christmas decorations, That's right? Not, Not at someone. Listeners, please do not spray a pressure washer or a snowblower <laughs> directly at anyone or at animals. It's dangerous. <laughs> How would but you like hook that up? Like Bellagio fountain style. Yeah. A pressure washer <laughs> going into the snowblower and then just hey, shooting Siri. like stuff over Oh, no, your separately. Mouth. Separately. Oh, like separate. one to fling like the snow <laughs> and, you know, one to. <laughs> Um, I should have done that as our last pick. So my my, my last pick, I swear. Um, Vercel just the S I R I word, and then I got sent over to audio uh, over there. That's why you don't use those products. Uh oh, I can't hear you all now. It's going to be an interesting. This is a conversation interview. you have to have after the pod. This could get nasty. Uh, so my my last pick is Vercel's uh, just acquired Turbo Repo. Uh, which is a mono repo tool essentially. Um, if you've used NX or Lerna, similar but uh, pretty cool product. I have not tried to move our stuff over to Turbo yet, but I'm hoping so. Soon. We're using Lerna, right? And since we're, we're on the we're, cell... we're using Lerna, but not the way not we really. should be using Lerna. So I'm hoping this actually works. And that's it. That's it, folks. <laughs> Uh, Rob, I've realized through our conversation um, how much smarter of an individual you are than I am. So I'm glad you kind of brought it down to our yeah. level, even though there's a lot of acronyms. I now know a little more about databases. So thank you. You're like six languages deep and like <laughs> know everything there is to know about databases and how they work. And I could Maybe never. Like, no, goodbye. no, no, please. <laughs> No, it's so complicated. I, I scratched the surface on this stuff. Believe me, that's not false modesty. Our engineers are brilliant. And we um, didn't get to mention, but we are also the shuffleboard champions of Spelt Summit Watch Party. So, yeah, that part also is true. Good at athletics because <laughs> oh. shuffleboard takes so much. Mm -hmm. Hang on, was this was this table shuffle or full on? No, like it's like a bowling alley, but yeah. it's a shuffleboard like triangle, and it was intense. Like I, imagine I a cruise ship, but without the listeria. Oh, <laughs> I noticed it was in kind of a sketchy warehouse <laughs> in New York somewhere. That seemed off. Everything in Brooklyn is in a sketchy warehouse. It's fine. <laughs> Fair enough. With that, yeah. Rob, thank you so much for coming on and chatting uh, all about Fauna. Can't wait to uh, start using it and more and uh, kind of see where it goes. I feel like there's more yeah. in the works. Yeah. I, thank you for talking yeah, about it. I'm going to go try is. the workshop out too. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Super. Cool. Thank you for having thank me. You. See ya.